Welcome to the Legislators Lounge. I'm Jim Webb, the host of the show, and my co-host is Brian Cherichello. Today with us, we have a special guest, Senator Kelly Ayotte. Welcome, Senator. Thank you. Good to be with you both. Senator, Appreciate welcome. it. Thank Thanks. you very much for coming. Um, let's, uh, let's start with uh, some of the committee assignments that you are on in Washington. Um, I know you're on the Armed Services Committee, mm -hmm. Budget Committee, um, Commerce, um, Homeland Security and Government Affairs, and Special Committee on Aging. Yes. And um, one of the major um, pieces right now on um, armed services is the military sexual assault bill, mm -hmm. which is really making national headlines. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, absolutely. Uh, first of all, um, you know, I'm, my husband served. He was an A-10 pilot, and so I come from a military family. It's such a privilege to serve on the Armed Services Committee. We have the very best military in the world. The men and women in, who serve are incredible. And obviously this week uh, with Memorial Day, we appreciate their sacrifices and what they've done. But what we've seen in the military is uh, there was a report recently, a uh, study done, 26,000 sexual assaults and only 3,400 reported. Right. And so we've had a series of hearings in the, the Senate about the concerns about military sexual assaults, uh, victims coming forward and uh, not wanting to come forward for fear that they're not, the cases won't be prosecuted or they won't be supported. So I'm co-sponsoring legislation with uh, Patty Murray from Washington to make sure, I bring my experience as a prosecutor in, in the civilian sector to this and having worked on these cases there, um, making sure that the people who are victims in the military actually get a special uh, victims council so that they're supported throughout the process, make sure that they get the support within the system so these cases are fully prosecuted. Right. And so we're just working on this issue to make sure we get it right. You know, my husband, uh, when I talk to him about it, and I've talked to many veterans about it, you know, they're the most angry about it because we've got such a great military. Right. And when there are sexual assaults that occur, it undermines uh, unit cohesiveness and readiness. And so uh, we're just gonna make sure that we, working with our military, uh, get the right laws in place so that they can address this and make sure it doesn't continue to happen. Great. Well, Senator, um, I'd like to ask you if you would like to talk a little bit about the Benghazi investigation, how you were one of mm -hmm. the fir first senators that called for a bipartisan um, investigation of the, of the actual incident and um, this being uh, Memorial Day, May 30th, we're recording this show. Right. Um, it's a spe it's, it's, what, what do you think about Secretary uh, Clinton's statement? What difference does it make to those veterans? Uh, first of all, I think that statement was just so wrong and misguided. And what difference does it make? We had four brave Americans that were murdered by terrorists, uh, one of them an ambassador. And uh, you know the other three brave Americans who served our country with distinction. And what matters is is getting to the bottom of what happened, making sure that the American people are told the truth about what happened, taking the lessons learned so that it doesn't happen again. It absolutely matters when you have four brave Americans murdered. And uh, the, my interest in this from the beginning has you know my background as a prosecutor. It just didn't smell right. The facts that were coming forward just were not consistent. Uh, with what even using your common sense happens. I mean, let's face it, people don't take RPGs and mortars to a spontaneous demonstration. Right. Uh, the, what we found out is that this was a terrorist attack, obviously, that high-level officials, including our Secretary of Defense, knew from the beginning that it was a terrorist attack. But there are still many questions that need to be answered uh, because we've seen with the recent testimony in the House of Representatives Gregory Hicks, who was the second in command uh, for the Libyan embassy, he was in Tripoli, the last person to talk to Ambassador Stevens and told him he was under attack. He raised serious questions, including uh, a question about uh, there were special forces that were in Tripoli that wanted to go to Benghazi and they were told not to. Who gave them that order right. and why? We have the greatest military on earth that they couldn't respond to an attack that occurred over seven hours. I mean, there are real problems with that, and we need more questions answered. Finally, I'd like to see uh, those survivors on the ground be given the protection uh, that they need to come forward so that we can get a full accounting of what happened. Absolutely. And then ultimately what troubled me th about this was, you know, you had Ambassador Susan Rice going on every Sunday show and talking about this being, you know, a reaction to a video. 
um, denying that it was a pre-planned terrorist attack and saying things like uh, con security at the consulate was uh, substantial and strong, and it wasn't true. And so I think the American people deserve the truth on this. I agree with you. Thank you. <clears throat> good, very good point. Um, another national headline that we're talking about is the uh, online sales tax for Internet. And um, how would that affect some of the small New Hampshire businesses mm. in, uh, in New Hampshire? I mean, you've well, led the way on that as well. Huh? This is uh, this is one of those things that happens in Washington that you just scratch your head. Uh, there is a bill. It's called the Main Street Fairness Act. Um, it's anything but fair, especially to New Hampshire. So I've, misna I've named it differently. I call it the Online Sales Tax Collection Act because what it would do, uh, you know, what it would do, Brian, basically, is it would require every online business, not just in New Hampshire, but across the country, to collect taxes for the rest of the nation. And we're not just talking about each state having a sales tax. There are over 9,600 tax jurisdictions. In the state of Illinois, each county can have a, t a tax in each locality. And so can you imagine our online businesses? So th there's someone from Illinois who buys something from an online business in New Hampshire, and then you, this business, has to go collect taxes for Illinois. And then they can be subject to audits in Illinois. They can be dragged into their court system. It is so outrageous, especially to our state. We made the decision, you know as legislators, right. we make the hard decisions to come up with a responsible budget. We don't have a sales tax. And this really tramples on our decision not to have a sales tax. So I've been fighting this. Good. It passed the Senate and is now up, uh, but not certainly over my objection and strenuous fight with uh, examples from businesses here in New Hampshire. Right. And now the House of Representatives needs to kill this thing because it is bad for business and certainly bad for New Hampshire. It most certainly, I think that would most certainly cost the business of oh. New Hampshire. Uh, so much, uh, some businesses may go out of business because well, they couldn't Jim, afford the regulatory right. costs. You're right, can you imagine? Okay, I gotta figure out that um, 9,600 tax jurisdictions. So if I'm selling online I gotta, and I gotta collect taxes for Massachusetts, now this is why it's so wrong too. <laughs> you know we had that case where the Town Fair Town Tire Fair case, tire. Exactly. where they came over from Massachusetts to buy tires in New Hampshire, and then the mass revenue agents tried to force our business to collect their taxes. Right. So what this would do, make our businesses collect their taxes. Right. How wrong is that? Yeah, that just doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, yeah. people live in New Hampshire, they, they appreciate we don't have a sales tax. They come shop here, whether it's online or with our, our, our merchants, uh, on the ground because we don't have a sales tax. Good for us. We yeah, made that absolutely. choice. And are you hearing from a lot of small businesses? Are they contacting? Oh yeah, I heard from a ton of businesses in New Hampshire, oh, good. from every type of business that thinks this is so wrong and they're against it. Yeah. All right, Senator, uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the the IRS, which is in the news recently, oh. and how the, the the director recently resigned as a result of this problem. So if you'd like to tell us a little bit about what's going on. Sure. With that. I mean, this is obviously uh, every American should be concerned about this. Uh, you had the, there's evidence that has come forward that the IRS was actually uh, targeting certain groups for further questioning, delaying their application for nonprofit status based on their viewpoints, based on what they stood for. I mean, how un-American is that? And this right now, I think, this is an issue that members of both sides of the aisle are very concerned about. And so we will have a full bipartisan investigation. We've got to get to the bottom of this. If we can, none of us, uh, obviously, it's hard enough when the IRS comes to talk to you as an individual or right. business, but to think that they may target you right. because of your views is so wrong. And we need to hold those who are responsible and higher ups who condoned or authorized this fully accountable and make sure this never happens again, because otherwise people just can't have trust um, in a very important part of our government. Absolutely. Well, the IRS itself is, um, that's why Obamacare and all that was put under right. the IRS because of their powers. The, the powers well, of the IRS are, are, everybody's afraid of the well, IRS. Jim, this is a real concern because, you know, under the president's health care law, there is much more authority given to the IRS because if you think about if you don't purchase health insurance then the IRS can fine you and 
We know that's a tax because our Supreme Court has said that. Right. So they're hiring new IRS agencies, uh, agents to administer uh, the health care law. And so they're going to have greater authority. So if we don't get to the bottom of this and make sure that the laws are administered fairly, I mean, this is a real worry, I think, for anyone. And so we've got to get to the bottom of it, hold people accountable. And it's a real concern when I think, you know, I'm obviously I voted to repeal uh, the Affordable Care Act because I don't think it's the right direction for us. And I'm hearing a lot of concerns right. from businesses in New Hampshire and individuals that are going to lose, that are concerned that they may lose uh, health care coverage they have now because of it. Right. But putting that aside for a minute, can you imagine if the IRS, if there are problems in terms of people at the top targeting certain groups, that's got to stop and we got to hold them accountable. That's just un-American to me. Yeah. It is. It's, it doesn't make any sense. Well, that's like why... Being bullied. <laughs> it is. And you know what? I think the this is something that's very bipartisan. I mean, there's going to be a rigorous bipartisan investigation because this is just something that we've got to get to the bottom of. Right. And I, I forget her name, the, the, the woman who uh, heads up the IRS actually went in front of... Uh, well, Lois Lerner, who was the head of that unit uh, at one point, came before the House of Representatives and asserted her Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. If that doesn't tell you what the problem is, right. that, that this woman felt that she had to assert her right not to incriminate herself, that tells you that there are real issues here. And by the way, right. One of the worst parts about it is she's still getting paid, oh. um, you know, while she's been put on leave, and that's got to stop that's too. Incredible. She should go. Yeah, Senator, we talked, we just touched about health care. Let's so let's go and expand about that a little bit more. The Obamacare and what that's going to do or possibly do, again, to the small businesses of New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. Um, there's, there's a lot of questions that people have about this, and it's, it's well, they're huge questions because uh, the regulations are still coming out from Health and Human Services, and they are stacks in stacks of them. So there's a lot of questions that I hear from businesses of all different levels. What does this mean? What's the definition of a full-time employee, a part-time employee? But just to raise a couple of issues. First of all, the bill itself, I think, is hurts, hurts growth of businesses. Because I've heard from businesses in New Hampshire, it applies to businesses that are 50 employees or more and that um, some businesses aren't going to expand to, to get beyond that 50 because they're worried they can't afford it. Second, it, de it uh, defines uh, part-time employee as you know 29 hours and under. So you, I've already had at one of my town halls, I had a man stand up and say, my wife's hours are being dropped, and now she used to have health care. She's not going to because they just can't afford it, the hospital that she's working for. So we're hearing those stories from individuals on the ground. And then ultimately, it's causing in um, healthcare costs. We've seen what I've heard from businesses; their premiums are going up even more. And so we had a real problem with costs to start with, mm -hmm. and this bill is making that worse, in my judgment. Yeah, I read somewhere where some of the doctors in California are, are reading the, the some of the the verbiage here about uh, the healthcare bill, and they're choosing to move somewhere else right. or go somewhere else to practice because it just doesn't make sense, you know. Well, it's, it's, we want physicians, obviously, to focus on what's right for their patient. And so I I've certainly have heard some concerns from physicians as well on this bill. Yeah, I've heard the same. I actually spoke to my doctor about it. And originally, um, my doctor was all for it. And now that it's actually in place, he's against it, 100% against it. But he was for it before, but he didn't know the details. So right. and now that it's starting to roll out, he's, he's saying, well, now it's Well, I think it treatments. goes, unfortunately, back to what Nancy Pelosi said, we're going to have to pass it to know what's in it, which is not the right way to do legislation, as you know. No. All right, so, uh, Senator, um, I'd like to, first off, we're being bombarded by our, our uh, special interest groups with commercials on the gun issue. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'd like to uh, talk to you a little bit about the, the gun issue, and if you'd like to, I know you sponsored some real legislation to actually uh, require those background checks for the mentally ill and, and, and so forth. Right. Would you like to talk to? Uh, sure. You know, first of all, you know, I know that New Hampshire viewers are seeing all these ads saying I voted against background checks. Uh, understand those ads are false, and they're being funded by Mayor Bloomberg a group that he founded that is, uh, you know, Mayor Bloomberg, he's also the guy that would like to say you can't have a big gulp soda. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, I, I guess the question at the end of the day, I represent New Hampshire. I don't represent people in New York City. 
And uh, we are, I had the privilege of serving as attorney general of the state. Uh, I was a murder prosecutor myself. So this is an area I have some background in and uh, care deeply about holding criminals accountable. And so I supported legislation that we have a deficiency, a broken background check system where the mental health records aren't getting in. We've had lax enforcement of the system where very few cases are being prosecuted. Uh, let me just give you one number, 2010, 47,000 either felons or fugitives from justice or a disqualifying criminal conviction uh, tried to buy guns illegally in our background check system. You know how many people were prosecuted for that? 44 cases brought, only 13 wow. prosecutions. So what I supported had enhanced effort, uh, resources for prosecution and greater criminal penalties. So, uh, you know, obviously, I think the ads that are being played are false, and out-of-state interests want to come and tell New Hampshire what they think. Um, I represent New Hampshire, and I reviewed this legislation carefully. And it's good to see that the, the top law, law enforcement officers in the state also support you, because we see the, 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 the commercials on the other yeah. end saying that they truly support you. So they know who you are and, and what, you, what you represent, so. Well, I work, you know, obviously, I, it was a privilege to work with the police in the state, and they do an amazing, amazing job um, every day for our state. We're blessed to have them. Well, also as a legislator, what we see is uh, many bills come before us that may sound good, but right. when you dig into the actual bill, it isn't as good as right, it exactly. looks. Right, exactly. The so other thing is, Jim, uh, you know, I worked with, across the aisle on improving our mental health system, and that is what's underlying each of these mass violence situations. It's uh, not a background check issue, it's been a mental health issue. And, uh, and I think that's where we need to focus our attention also. Absolutely. I mean, in Connecticut, wasn't, wasn't it the mom, the mother, that actually gave the child yeah. the weapons? And he, no, had, he this, had some no, issues. This no. was one where the, the, the son in Connecticut, unfortunately, the son murdered the mother. And then took and, the weapon. And took her weapon. So um, oh, not okay. an issue of a background. She legitimately had the weapons, and he murdered her. And so to stop someone who would murder their own mother, to get weapons. Um, there obviously are significant mental health issues there, uh, but uh, this is something that, um, you know, obviously didn't have a connection to a background check issue. Right. Um, I just read that you are sponsoring some, it's called the Never Contract with the Enemy legislation. Yes. And you just spoke about that a couple of days ago, and we saw that in the news. Would you like to expand on that? Uh, I would be happy to. You know, it, it kind of makes total sense. We shouldn't ever contract with exactly. the enemy. <laughs> but uh, serving on the Senate Armed Services Committee, what I found out was that we took the, in theater in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had a situation where the contracting rules were the rules that we had if you were doing it stateside. And so our commanders on the ground didn't have the authority to cut off funds soon enough. They had to go through this bureaucracy, even if they thought they were dealing with the enemy and they had evidence of that. And so I helped work with Scott Brown to get legislation passed called No Contracting with the Enemy. I went back to Afghanistan in January, talked to the commanders on the ground. They said, we appreciated that legis legislation. In fact, we, served 30, we saved $30 million with that legislation that we did together. Good. However, we need to extend it and we need to extend it to the State Department and USAID and even make the limits lower so we can catch more of the subcontractors. Right. And that's what our new legislation is, myself and Richard Blumenthal from Connecticut. Which never is bipartisan, by It's the way. bipartisan, absolutely. Never contracting with the enemy. So we're hoping to get that passed this year. And it's, come on, so common sense. <laughs> we don't want our taxpayer dollars going to those who are trying to harm our soldiers. Think about something that, I mean, the fact that it was happening was outrageous yeah, that, in yeah. my view. Absolutely. Um, you know, let's lead into that with an another thing since we were just talking about financing the military and all that. Um, how, what, do you, what do you think about the missile to nowhere? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, having served on the Armed Services Committee, uh, I want nothing more than to make sure that our men and women in uniform have what they need to protect our country and to protect themselves. But there have been times, like in any government agency, where there's waste. And I found out about this program called the MEADS program. I, I called it the Missile to Nowhere because it was a missile program that was intended to replace the Patriot. We were working with Europe to produce it. We spent over a billion dollars on it, never going to get a result. The Army said they didn't want it, wasn't going to produce a result our troops could use, 
And this year, people trying to protect their own interests in their states still put $380 million in the appropriations bill for it. Uh, I brought amendments to strike it, and I wasn't given a vote on it. So uh, it was outrageous because can you imagine what we can do with $380 million for a missile that's going nowhere? Yeah. I did eventually get a vote on it on the budget resolution uh, where I got over, I got a huge number of votes, over 90 votes, but the money had already been appropriated. But I'm going to continue to fight this missile to nowhere. Can you imagine our taxpayer dollars going to something that will never help our troops? Yeah, that just doesn't it's, make sense at it's all. It's like the bridge to nowhere. It is. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> it's the missile Jim, to nowhere. <laughs> instead of the bridge to nowhere, it's the missile to nowhere. And I am always looking for ways to cut wasteful spending because we owe it to the American people, and unfortunately, there's too much of that in Washington. Yeah. That's part of our, our uh, New Hampshire uh, way of life. Yes, it's it? our ethos in New Hampshire. <laughs> <Yeah>. Absolutely. <laughs> um, I think we have a small amount of time, but let's talk about sequestration. Yes. And how that's uh, dragging government down, and do you see any effects of that ha um, here at the local level in New Hampshire? Well, the thing what I worry about sequestration is, um, is for our military especially, because it's obviously implemented over a 10 year period and the military took a disproportionate cut over it. And let me just step back a minute on sequestration. If we, had, if we could budget regularly and appropriate properly, we wouldn't have to be in a position where you do across the board because the state legislature you prioritize and uh, we went almost four years in the United States Senate without a budget. And so I think that that's stepping back where we need to be. Prioritize, what's a priority for us? What programs are working and not working? Right. And that's a smarter way to cut spending, and it's really what we should be doing. So I think that's going forward what we have to do. There's obviously been examples where the administration has tried to gild the lily on some of this, whether it was trying to close the contract towers and uh, for through the FAA, one of which was in Nashua right. that we kept open with other funds. Furlough and so, the right, Navy. yeah, no, the furloughs are are very real for our military and for some of them thankfully most of them at the shipyard are stopped there may be some that that unfortunately still are going forward but um, I just think that what we need to do is make sure that we're looking at the big picture that we're budgeting that we're prioritizing Excellent. okay well um, looks like we're just about out of time here but I, I'd like to um, say th first off thank you and um, yes, thank, you, thank you for much. being on the show and Thanks, if you'd like Jim. to close with anything um, more than happy to. Try. Yeah, well, first of all, let me thank uh, both of you for your work in the legislature on behalf of New Hampshire. And I would just say to your viewers, thank you. Uh, whatever issues that my office can help you with, uh, feedback that you have, uh, please contact our website. Uh, I'm here to serve you, and it is a real privilege to serve the state of New Hampshire. Thank you. All right, thank you. This has been the Legisl Legislators Lounge. <laughs>